Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's conversation at noon. My name is Rebecca Tabor Conover. I'm head of public programs at the Connecticut Democracy Center at Connecticut's Old State House, and we are delighted to have you joining us today. Today's program is about the HMT RONA, the Allies' big secret of World War II and its Connecticut connection. We will be monitoring comments on the Facebook page and near the end of the program, please do submit your questions as we'll ask our speakers to answer them and record them for you. Today's program focuses on one of the Allies' greatest secrets during World War II. The HMT Rona, a British warship that was in the Mediterranean, was hit by a radio-guided missile on November the 26th, 1943. More than a thousand Americans from every state except Montana died in this disaster, making it the greatest loss of American life in the open sea. There were several units on board the ship that had close connections to Connecticut. Today, you're going to learn more about this largely unknown historical event. I'd like to now ask our speakers to join us, and it's my pleasure to introduce three speakers today. Catherine Ladnier, John Dolan, and Danny Walden. A native of Los Angeles, California, Catherine Ladnier grew up unaware of her family's significant contribution to World War II. All that changed when she discovered hundreds of letters, along with postcards, telegrams, newspaper clippings, and photographs that had been saved by her mother, Eva Lee Brown. This discovery led her on a quest to learn more about her family's service in World War II, and she ended up writing a play. Catherine is a graduate of Mills College and Harvard University and works as a securities compliance consultant. She serves on the advisory council of Lyndhurst, a property of the National Trust for Historic Preservation, and on Connecticut's own Beardsley Zoo. John Dolan is a community volunteer who first learned of the Rona through a neighbor. He serves on the Rona Remembrance Committee in West Haven, Connecticut. This, connect, excuse me, this committee was put together to honor the three sons of the town who died in the disaster. John participated in a panel discussion at the FDR Museum in November of 2018 entitled Ordinary Americans. John is a lifelong West Haven resident and a retired Metro North Railroad conductor. Last but not least, joining us um, from a little further afield is Danny Walden. Danny is a retired educator from Dyersburg, Tennessee. One of the great things about, uh, I think, online is we can have visitors join us from far away. Uh, Danny served nine years as an elementary school teacher, 20 years as an elementary school principal, and 10 years as a staff developer and central office administrator. In 1980, he was the district teacher of the year for Tennessee, and he received the Distinguished Community Service Award from the Dyersburg Dyer County Chamber of Commerce, Commerce rather, in 2007. Danny is the president of the Dyer County Historical Society, and he's a graduate of the Dyersburg State Community College, and he received his bachelor's and master's degrees from the University of Tennessee at Martin. So I wanna thank all of our three speakers for joining us today. Um, we're gonna to hand it off to Catherine and um, we'll see our, our gentleman a little bit later. And um, Catherine, just let us uh, go move. Okay. So uh, you want me to start speaking now, Rebecca? Yes. Um, I want to thank you for inviting me and Danny and John to discuss the Rona, which is uh, unknown to history, despite the fact that it was uh, the hit on the Rona essentially began the Missile Age. The Germans have started experimenting with what were considered new weapons of war in the early 40s. Uh, on November the 26th, 1943, which was Thanksgiving, the Rona was part of a convoy of ships on the way to the China-Burma-India theater of war. It was hit on that day by a radio-controlled rocket-guided missile. More than 1,100 U.S. servicemen uh, perished. 
my Uncle Bill survived. He was a lieutenant in the 853rd Engineers Aviation Battalion, which was the largest military unit on the Rona. There were eight units on the Rona and four which had connections to Connecticut. The enlisted men in the 853rd came from Bradley Field and were sent to Dyersburg, Tennessee, where the Rona was uh, formed as a military unit. Uncle Bill, by this time, had graduated from, um, my Uncle Bill had graduated from Officer Candidate School and was sent to Dyersburg. Uh, uncle, I, I knew my uncle, but he died when I was quite young, and I never knew anything about this until my mother died in 2001, leaving behind a treasure trove of letters. And I <clears throat> discovered the Rona bit by bit by bit over the years. The first letter I received was from a dear lady in Oklahoma City, in which she had written to the officers of the 853rd inquiring about them and if they had heard anything from their loved ones. She said that on December 28th, she received a telegram from the War Department stating that her husband, Lieutenant Fred H. Leach, had been missing in action since November 26th in the North Africa area. All of the of those who perished received the same notice. And the Rona is the worst at sea disaster in American history. The War Department estimated that during, war, during World War II, 3,604 were lost at sea. The Rona accounted for one third of those losses, and yet no one has ever heard of it. We've heard of the USS Indianapolis, the US Arizona, but nothing on the Rona. You can go to uh, the library and look up, the, check out every book on World War II and the chances of you finding anything on the Rona are slim to none. And there's there's several theories why it's remained a mystery to this day, and we can certainly discuss that. The Rona was declassified in 1993, yet we still know nothing about it. And the only reason I do is from you know the letters, which were my mother saved everything, uh, and she but she didn't she didn't file the letters in chronological order, so it was just one letter after another. And over the years, I've made some very dear friends. In 2008, I joined the Rona Survivors Association as my Uncle Bill's representative and have attended every reunion since then. Uh, unfortunately, our reunion, which was scheduled for this past June in Salt Lake City, had to be canceled and, due to the pandemic. And as everyone knows, this is the 75th anniversary of the end of World War II, yet the pandemic has uh, overshadowed that and lest we forget let's let's try to honor those who served in World War II and I want to certainly honor those who served on the HMT Rona. And just to let you know Catherine if I can interrupt your we've got the PowerPoint going so when you're ready I've got the slide up of your mom's envelope so just let yes. me know when you're ready to proceed with other slides. Uh, well this this you can see is Lieutenant William George Brown, the Army Air Base in Dyersburg, Tennessee, Eva Lee Brown, uh, my mother, Route 4, Box 5, Easley, South Carolina. This is the house in which she was born and Uncle Bill was born, and uh, their younger sister, Vanessa, number two, was born. And this was their home place, and they loved it dearly. And Uncle Bill would always write, and want to know how the farm is doing and how are the chickens. And my mother would write back that Uncle Bill's pigs were hogs. Just little things that, that meant so much to him coming from the home. He, he wasn't interested in the politics at the time. He was only interested in what was happening at home. And over the years, I have met some dear people in our Kansas City reunion a few years ago. I met this lovely lady and her niece, whose uncle Russell Trant was stationed at Bradley Field. 
and he perished. You'll see missing in action and deceased. And these were letters that Russell Trant's mother received. Coming back to her, deceased returned to center. The Trant family received six deceased return to sender letters. And it's, um, I can't look at these and not have, feel very sad. In one letter that Mrs. Trant wrote to her son, she included two sticks of Wrigley gum in it. Just, just the small things meant so much. And unfortunately, so Staff Sergeant Russell Trent, who was a member of the 853rd, perished with the Rona. And there's included were memorial to another soldier who had served in the 853rd on the Rona. And this was the service that was given in his hometown in Kansas. And it's, again, you know, very touching. And, and this family, the Jessup family, received the same notice that everyone else did, missing in action in the North Africa area. And um, this is, I, I love the stationery, Bradley Field and the, the plane. And this was, uh, September of 1943, so in two months, he, uh, Russell would be on the uh, HMT Rona. And HMT stands for His Majesty's Transport. The Rona was a British ship. It had been built in the 20s as a luxury liner for the, the Britain-India trade. And it was, like so many other ships, was converted to wartime use. It was not a warship, it was strictly a transport. Catherine, can you talk a little bit about the um, connection with Connecticut and the Rona? Well, all the enlisted men came from Bradley Field, and they were sent to Dyersburg where they trained. Another unit that was on the Rona was the 322nd Fighter Control, and they actually uh, went to Yale. Um, one of the members of our Rona Association, this lovely man named Russ Moore, gave us a copy of his memoirs and he talked about, they went to Yale University, he was training to be a communications officer and they spent 16 weeks at Yale. Um, and that, the 332nd was on the Rona as well as uh, other two other units that I'm less familiar with. And um, one dear man who was also in the 332nd, Carl Stokesnucker, uh, gave us, um, again, his memoirs, and he was assigned in 332nd uh, and at Bradley Field. And he's, he, he wrote something very sweet. He said, most of the boys went to Hartford, Connecticut. There was much military industry there. Many young women worked in the factories and had money they wished to spend on soldiers. So that was the city for the guys who wanted a wild time at a low cost. You never told me that, Rebecca. <laughs> the hidden secrets of Hartford. <laughs> the hidden secrets of Hartford. And it, it, you know, it's, the, ties, the ties to Connecticut are very strong. The strongest one being the uh, connection with the 853rd Engineers Aviation Battalion. And again, it's, it's been lost to history. Uh, there, uh, there are many reasons why it's been lost to history. I'm, I'm not sure there's a definitive answer. And over the years, I have met so many dear people. We, one, two of them are right here, Danny Walden and, uh, and John Dolan. The USS Pioneer was, uh, uh, one of the ships that rescued survivors. Uncle Bill was rescued by a British ship. I do not know the name of it. He didn't say it in his letter. But he was rescued by the uh, uh, a British ship. The USS Pioneer rescued most of the survivors. Michael Walsh, who is 
our past president of the Rona Survivors Association, his stepfather was on the USS Pioneer. And here's the uh, aerial view of the Dyersburg Army Base, but I'm, I would defer to my dear friend, Danny Walden, to discuss that. Yes, well, I think it's time for us to transition over, so we're gonna ask Danny to join us. Well, hello from West Tennessee. It's my pleasure to be here as a representative of the Dyer County Historical Society. Um, our connection in West Tennessee uh, centers around this particular air base that was constructed uh, to train uh, B-17 bombers, the flying fortresses that were used during World War II. This is an aerial photograph of the runways and the uh, uh, training area down you can see below there. Um, and for those of us that were raised in the 60s, uh, this was an abandoned airfield and we heard it called Dyersburg Army Air Base, but until um, I met Catherine a few years ago and learned the story uh, we were spending our time really with local Dyer County history. Uh, the history of this place is connected to not only World War II, but to the history of Dyer County because it's actually located in an adjoining county. It's in Lauderdale County uh, in Halls, Tennessee. And today, uh, the people who care about uh, Army history and uh, veterans history I created a museum on this site that is very well done. Catherine's been here and seen that. She's been here to do a presentation on the Rona. And we're trying to tell this story because when I first heard it, it was like, okay, why have I never heard of this particular uh, disaster in the Mediterranean and what's the connection to Dyersburg? Well, uh, the story was that as we're collecting our history about local things, uh, this particular uh, air base, uh, called the Dar Dyersburg Army Air Base, Halls, Tennessee. You can see that there was a lot of activity there and the uh, engineering group that Catherine's uncle was part of was trained here and they ended up being sent from here after learning how to build airfields. They were gonna go to India uh, as part of the war effort and they were in uh, North Africa and boarded the Rona uh, as uh, a group and then the boat was uh, uh, attacked by a German uh, airplane that actually uh, sunk it with a remote control bomb. The interesting thing about that story to me was that uh, when Catherine relayed the story to me, I'm thinking, wait a second, I've never heard of a remote control bomb in, 19, in the 1940s. But the story is that uh, the Germans had developed this particular type of technology and there was a uh, uh, person on the airplane with a joystick actually guiding this particular bomb. You see a couple of pictures there, kind of explain what it looked like, uh, into the Rona uh, and sunk it and then killed over 1,100 uh, Americans who were uh, of various uh, responsibilities in the war effort. That's that's not so significant until you find out that our government and the British government sort of covered it up because they didn't want this technology to swing the um, uh, efforts toward the Germans during World War II. Uh, and they were concerned that this secret weapon, we'll call it, um, might affect the war effort. So uh, Dyersburg and Dyer County and the Dyersburg Army Air Base uh, plays a role because this is the site where those uh, engineers were trained and they were on their way to India to build uh, airfields during the war. Great, and you mentioned the um, museum that's being constructed on the, on the air base. Has that opened yet already? Oh yes, uh, the museum has been open for, oh gosh, probably 20 plus years. Um, the former mayor of Halls uh, is responsible for it. Uh, she's gotten some grants from the federal government to kind of help uh, commemorate all veterans, not just the veterans of the air base, but veterans in general. And there's a lot of effort goes into um, commemorating our veterans through 
uh, nonprofits across the country. One example I'll give you is that um, the father of uh, Fred Smith of uh, FedEx fame uh, will bring a bus up to uh, the museum and load up uh, veterans of the war and will take them over to D-Day, uh, those commemorations they have there. Um, and a couple of people from Dyersburg have been part of that um, in the past. I think one gentleman from Dyersburg has been there three times on that particular tour, and it's all free uh, given to the veterans to commemorate the efforts that they uh, gave us during World War II. Great. Well, thank you. I think we're ready to switch over to John at this point. Alrighty, John, if you can just let me know, I'll move ahead in the slides. And um, just Am I, on? I think I'm on. Am I on? You are on, yes. You can hear me. Okay, well. Yep, and John, just let me know when you're ready for the next slide, please. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. And uh, thank you for giving uh, me this opportunity to speak uh, how we learned of the Rona tragedy here in West Haven and the attempts we made to spread the word and also to try to honor not only the three West Haven soldiers that were lost, but all the casualties and survivors of the Rona. Uh, for us, it began in 2009 when Pam Gardner, the, the new principal at West Haven High School, uncovered in a closet a book. Inside the book were three typewritten pages listing over 100 West Haven High students who had left school early to serve. Also a list, a sad list of men who were killed or missing in action. And she saw fit to put this in the hands of Joe Weber, longtime West Haven resident. He's a Korean wartime veteran in the Air Force and a past Grand Marshal of the parade, Memorial Day parade here in West Haven. And when he saw this, his goal was to honor these men and their families who left early. And that did in fact happen. Uh, Joe spearheaded the effort to honor them and it was on the next flag day, June of 2010. They had a wonderful ceremony at the Ward Heitman House in West Haven. It's a historical home, Joe's on the board there. And they had a number of the veterans and their families come to this ceremony to honor them. And at that time, Leading up to it, there was an envelope sent to the Ward Heitman House containing newspaper clippings. It was sent by a former resident, and that was put into the hands of Joe. And as it's shown up on the screen, one of the clippings torn in the corners, no date showing, but the clipping was West Haven Buddies Lost in Sinking. So Joe had this clipping along with. Uh, the missing in actions, which our three soldiers were listed on there, that was found in the book. And a period of about seven years went by with Joe had this in mind. What can we do to find out more about them? So that's when I got involved because coming out of church one Sunday morning, ran into Joe and he asked me if I was good with the computer. And uh, I said, well, if you mean fixing them, no, but I use it. So he, he sent me on a mission to he gave me four pieces of information from this newspaper clipping, the names of the soldiers, John Cox, Pasquale Lajadice, and Pacifico Miglior. He told me from the clipping that they enlisted the same day, they died the same day, and that there was a front page story in the New Haven Register. So that started my internet and internet research, and also uh, my sister, who's a West Haven librarian, Direct me, directed me to New Haven because they had the microfilms for the New Haven Register there. So uh, it was an intermittent search, probably over a period of a year, but uh, about a year later, well, within a year, I put in a request to the Rona Survivors Memorial Association. Uh, th theirs was a treasure trove of information that I came upon on the website. So in their guest book, I uh, made a request for any information regarding our three we call them the buddies at this point, as the headline read. So I'll just refer to them as our three buddies. And uh, I had a quick response from uh, Janice Pomelia. She's the secretary of the association and uh, giving me some leads of uh, where I might be able to find out more information. Uh, also at that time, reached out to West Haven High School, their uh, director of their uh, department head, social studies, Mark Consorti, 
And right away, he said, whatever we can do to get this out, get this information out, honor them, we'd be glad to do it. Um, it was that summer, summer of 18, when a couple of, a couple of contacts we made. The University of New Haven, we were welcomed in there. Uh, Ron Quagliani, Bruce Barber. Uh, Ron led us over to the West Haven Veterans Museum, made our introduction there. We were well received there, maybe a little incredulous as our first meeting there in trying to see if we could have some kind of a ceremony of sorts or a program there. Uh, that's when we first met Catherine walking in with her box of letters and Joe and they weren't sure, and because they had never heard of the Rona, you know, who are these three people coming in with this? But they were wonderful. They opened up their museum to us. And as you'll hear a little bit more, they, they were such a big part in what we were able to do here in West Haven. So uh, the West Haven Veterans Museum, like Dan talked about in, uh, in Tennessee, this is a little gem right across from the West Haven train station. If anyone gets a chance to go there uh, and they have a website, you can find out their hours and such. So, great. So, um, oh, the, the picture of the three soldiers, I was taken from there. Two of them were their high school yearbooks that just flashed on. Now this picture is from a program that I'll get to in a minute, but uh, just over those six months, we had a number of different programs. We were a couple of radio programs that UNH connected with, with us on a TV program. Um, the FDR program, which uh, Rebecca mentioned, uh, we had two students participated in that program, reading letters that Catherine had supplied. Uh, UNH, we had the West, ha the West Haven Voice, our newspaper, Bill Riccio, the editor, that uh, put in some newspaper articles, and Joe Weber uh, that he had written, Connecticut Magazine, had a story for us, Mark uh, Zaretsky. And uh, it all, we had a nice program, a little uh, remembrance at the Thanksgiving football game, which was 75 years, almost at a date with the playing of taps for them. Uh, that led ultimately to the West Haven Remembers Verona. And this picture up here is, it was a multifaceted program. Uh, Senator Blumenthal attended, a couple of our uh, legislative reps. And what, what I don't know if I call it, the, a very meaningful part of the program was in this picture here. It, that was part of a dramatic portrayal Joe Weber had written of our three buddies uh, giving a little background of them and taking them right through from enlistment until the tragic day of November 26, 1943. And when it came to their enlistment day, January 18, 1943, uh, we had Staff Sergeant Philip Lee from the Recruiting Center in New Haven. He administered the oath to the three soldiers, and then he asked the audience to stand up, and everyone uh, received the oath. And it was just a very powerful moment. So uh, that was a great program we had at the Veterans Museum. Um, that was followed a few months later. Michael Walsh and Jack Ballow, who have the documentary that'll be coming up, wrote it and are directing it. Uh, they came to West Haven and they talked to the social studies classes, like four different classes, about the Rona. They showed the documentary. And um, it's, it's so great to have the students. And I know that's a goal of them also to get the word out further. So. Uh, there's so much I could talk about, and I'm probably some things I'm missing, and, but it's been a wonderful experience to, oh, uh, June of 2019, we were invited to the Rona Survivors Memorial Association to their um, annual reunion in Virginia Beach to talk about what we found out here in West Haven and what we did in West Haven. It was just a wonderful experience. So uh, that just wanted to, Hey, well, get the word you. out, we, and this, this program here helps to get the word out. Oh, one thing I want to mention. In the newspaper story that was in the New Haven Register just before we had the program at the Veterans Museum, Joe got a phone call from a woman who had read the article in the Register. She's a school nurse at Hand High in Madison, and her uncle was a casualty of that, of the, on the Rona. And we got out to Hand High, we met with her, and we had plans to do a program uh, through some unforeseen circumstances. We didn't have the program, but uh, it's making connections like that. That is a bit of the goal of trying to get family members to know more about their loved ones that were lost. 
Great, thank you. I'm going to ask um, Catherine if you could just rejoin us for a moment. Um, and if we have a, a, a short um, introduction to the documentary, it's a it's mm -hmm. a video clip, and it, it's it's I'd say about five or six minutes. But if Catherine, you could set it up for us a little bit and tell us kind of what the trailer is and what what it it links to. Uh, Michael Walsh, who uh, I mentioned earlier, whose stepfather was on the USS Pioneer, is uh, been very, has been very active in the Roanoke Survivors Association for many years. He's our past president. And at every reunion, he would interview survivors and their family. And in, our, in 2018, our reunion in Memphis, Tennessee, we welcomed two new members to the Rona family, Jack and Barbara Ballow. They discovered their connection to the Rona, as I did, through letters. Uh, Jack was in the attic of their home that had been in Barbara's family for, I think, 100 years, and he found all these letters, and one thing led to another, and Barbara's uncle Joe uh, died in the Rona. And uh, New Jersey, we're in New Jersey, New Jersey lost uh, 79 sons in the sinking. Jack found out about us and came to our reunion in Memphis. Jack is a documentary filmmaker and he and Michael have teamed up to make this documentary, Rona Classified, It's Time to Tell the Truth. And it's particularly moving and I can't wait to see the entire documentary. Great, well that was a perfect setup, thank you. I'm gonna share my screen and hopefully technology will be kind to us and we will get that started. And Catherine, if you just wanna mute. This whole incident is classified secret. You're not to talk about it to anybody. Sworn to secrecy, I mean, you know, don't tell anyone. If you were to write home about it, you would be subject to court box. It was 1939. A riverside town in New Jersey by the name of South River was busy digging itself out of the Depression. Young and ambitious. Hold on, please. Joe was busy selling shoes at his new job. An Austrian scientist by the name of Dr. Herbert Wagner was busy with his own job, designing a radio-guided missile. His brilliant mind was engrossed in missile technology for years before he became a missile design engineer at an aircraft company who was under contract with Nazi Germany. As the graduating class of South River was smiling for pictures and Joe was heading down the aisle to receive his high school diploma back in New Jersey, a pilot in training by the name of Hans Doctorman received his own diploma, graduating top in his class at an airline school in Germany. A year later, the pilot, now known as Captain Hans Doctorman, was chosen for an elite group of pilots to train and experiment with Hitler's new guided missile called the HS-293. At 21 years old, the draft age in 1942, Joe Pajinski was recently married and on his way to basic training for the U.S. Army. Dear Mom. It's been a long time since I last wrote you. You'll have to excuse me because we have such little time to ourselves. I can no longer tell you anything we do here. Every little thing is a military secret. I was promoted to sergeant last Thursday and it made me very happy. I guess I'll say so long for now, but we'll write again soon. Your loving son, Sergeant Joe. 
the rookie soldier's first day of war started off the coast of North Africa, where he boarded a British transport ship called the HMT Rona, along with 2,000 other U.S. soldiers on Thanksgiving Day, 1943. The following day, the German pilot, Captain Hans Dopterman, now the commander of a bomber plane, launched a new high-tech missile. This new missile, the HS-293, designed by no other than scientist Dr. Herbert Wagner, was guided straight into the side of the HMT Roma. The bomb was moving at something like 500 miles an hour. So it was pretty fast and coming straight at us. Bomb exploded. That wood splintered and it flew around like a spear. You should see the, the, some of the bodies were impaled. It was four by fours, two by fours, right through their body. You couldn't walk the deck, it was so bloody. Burned in my mind, and looking back and seeing this huge hole, which I and others described big enough to drive a Mack truck through. And on the plane, and you could see the boys, some of them, running and trying to get out, and some didn't. I could hear men out there. The words I could hear was, uh, Mama, Mama. The War Department classified the attack, ordering all survivors to remain silent. The guided missile attack was erased from history, along with the thousand soldiers who died that day when the burning ship sunk to the bottom of the sea. Eighteen months later, Dr. Herbert Wagner surrendered to a U.S. Navy intelligence team. He was then smuggled out of Germany and flown to Washington, D.C. The U.S. War Department considered Dr. Wagner as a man with skills unmatched anywhere in the world. His knowledge was so critical to the development of missile technology that special agents brought Wagner back to the U.S. and inducted him into a secret program. He was swiftly employed at the brand new Missile Test Center in California. Dr. Herbert Wagner was rushed to the U.S. This is even before Hitler had taken his own life. We badly wanted Wagner's expertise in fighting the Japanese in the Pacific. The pilot commanding the bomber plane, who had just been promoted to major, didn't fare as well. Major Docterman was captured and imprisoned by the British Army. After the war ended, he was released and returned to Germany. Major Docterman carried the burden of the attack for the rest of his life, stating, The war will never be over in my mind until the day I die. He was very remorseful of what he had done, and he cried when he tried to talk about it. He asked his grandson, would he apologize for it on his behalf? I know of this disaster from the words of my grandfather, Major Hans Doctor. He never wanted to be a bomber pilot. He was told he may just have an accident if he didn't follow orders. I now carry not his burden, but his blood and the knowledge that war is held for all sides. Six months after the attack, Joe's mother received a telegram from the War Department stating that Sergeant Joseph Pajinski died. The telegram also stated, no information available. One night we were watching television and it was a war story, and it was a ship that was going down, and my husband was crying. And I said, oh, Fred, it's just a story. He said, but that happened to me. Excuse me, that's how I found out about the Rona. Those were a thousand people. How can you cover that up, but they did. May the bones around her rusty hull forever rest in peace. And the men who sail the Rona have a faith in history.
I'm just going to bring up um, a slide that has some information if uh, for those who are interested from more information, if you can just bear with me for a second. If you would like more information about the RONA, here are two websites that you can uh, go to. And I'm going to ask our speakers to rejoin us. Um, they wanted to do a roll call of the men from Connecticut who perished. Catherine, are you with okay, us? To start. Antonio, ready to start? Rebecca, I can't see that screen. I have the screen of the SHIPA. Okay, I need to be able to, hang on a second. So I can get around. I, I see John and Danny. Um, you can, you don't need to be on screen if you don't want to, you can be. Or if Catherine wants to join us on screen, she can as well. Uh, I. I I can't uh, start the video. It says you have to do it, Rebecca. All righty. Unfortunately, I can't do that, I'm afraid. Um, it says out oh, there you oh, go. There I am. There you are. You've rejoined us. Great. I'm Is ready. I, I, before you get started, excuse me for interrupting. I just want to say to our friends who are watching on Facebook Live, um, that please um, have some questions for us because after we do the roll call, we'll have an opportunity. To okay. Ask our speakers some questions. So I just want to encourage people to do that. Let's explain what these are, this, this roll call we're going to do. These are the Connecticut Ready boys to begin? that died on the Rona. Okay. Antonio Gallo, Westport. Louis LaPaula, New Canaan. John Campbell Moore, Greenwich. Charles Schnell, Danbury. Wilson Smith, Jr., Bridgeport. James Rinaldi, Thompsonville. Walter Slope, New Milford. Clifford Satterfield, Midtown. John Cox, West Haven. Pasquale J. Lagedice, West Haven. Pacifico Miglior, West Haven. Michael Montana, Waterbury. Joseph Morelli, Meriden. Vincent Valentini, New Haven. Jackson Miller, New London. Wilfred Laliberte, Putnam. And if I may, since I failed to mention his name in speaking about the uncle of the school nurse from Hand High, Dan, uh, Donna Konarski, his name is Gilbert Lanev from New York City with Connecticut Connections. And I would add that New York State lost 133 sons. Thank you. We're going to open this up for questions. Um, we have been monitoring Facebook. I don't see any questions so far, but if anyone has them, please type them in. We, in the comments for Facebook, we'd be happy to uh, ask some questions of our wonderful speakers here. I'm going to maybe start off with um, a question that I had as you were talking about how you had discovered this really unknown story. What are your plans for furthering um, the, the process of getting recognition for, for folks and, and for this disaster that people had no idea about? Do you have a, um, future plans? And, and maybe Catherine, you wanna talk a little bit about um, the play that you wrote 
to help further your, your goal and mission of, of bringing more awareness of this disaster? Well, I think that I, I like to think of something Rudyard Kipling said, if history were told in the form of stories, it would never be forgotten. And I'm sort of a theater junkie and I, I found the story so compelling that I turned it into a play called Apron Strings. One of the letters that my aunt wrote to my mother, Uncle Bill met May Titherington when he was working in Washington, D.C., just before he was drafted and sent overseas. And in one of the letters that he wrote to my aunt, he said that he, next time she made her aprons to make them with extra long strings because he was gonna tie himself in her strings and not, never get untied. And it's just, it, it, and Jack, when we had our reunion in Memphis in 2018, Jack Ballow taped it, it's available on YouTube. I think that telling the story, speaking to various groups as we did at the West Haven Veterans Museum, as we did at the FDR Library, helps. And I think the documentary, when it comes out, as you've seen, it's very, very powerful. Um, every year we lose part of our family. Just a few weeks ago, dear Ruth Canny died. Her husband was a survivor and she was just, she was sort of the rock of the organization. And uh, it's, yeah, I, I think speaking before various groups, before libraries, uh, the story has to get out. It's been left out of the history book. There are various theories why. One is that the American government deferred to the British because it was a British warship. And the, the, the Rona was, um, as one survivor told me, a rust bucket. It should never have been in operation. And it just goes to show that there are things that are inexplicable. And why this has been hidden from history is, there are several theories, as I said, and I would certainly defer to those who know more than I. What are the plans for the documentary that we just watched that trail and it's so compelling. I, I feel the same way uh, as you said earlier, Catherine, that you just want to watch it. Are they continuing to work on that? Yes, yes. And um, I believe that Michael and Jack expect the documentary to be out sometime next year. They're, they're working on it. I know both of them spent a great deal of time researching uh, I think Jack has, uh, I think he's been hired by the U.S. archives because he spends so much time researching the archives. Um, but I think once it comes out, it's going to be very powerful and, and the story will get out. Great. Well, one of our viewers, Ellen Weber, uh, mentioned that her father, yes, Aaron Weber from Philadelphia, was a survivor. Yes. We had some nice comments. Um, uh, from Beth Walker, thank you for getting this out here to make people aware of this tragedy. From Ida Lorenzen, uh, so moving to hear the names read. Thank you for telling the story and making us aware of the 103 losses in Connecticut. Can I jump in a minute? You mentioned Ellen Weber when we had our program in uh, a year ago, December, at the Veterans Museum. Ellen came up from her home in Pennsylvania and you know, as you just said, her father was a survivor and she read a very moving part of the program called the Table of Remembrance, various items on the table and their significance regarding the loss of servicemen. So it was great to have Ellen come up uh, and join us for that. Well, I'm glad she's joining us virtually today. Um, mm. That One nice thing about uh, being able to do things virtually you know, it's really interesting with um, with our uh, um, with these stories that are unknown. That really, it's at the grassroots level that you all made connections and, and brought it together. So, kind of in conclusion, I, I do have a, a little bit of a conclusion about some programs coming up. But I'd like to just maybe to end our program with you uh, ask, kind of, what's the how has getting involved with this changed you and your life and, and learning about the Rona and getting involved in spreading the story? Do you want me to start, I, I, Rebecca? 
Um, I have come to appreciate service and sacrifice, which we don't have as much of today as the greatest generation experienced. And just to think that my Uncle Bill was so brave and so courageous, and he went on to serve in India and to serve his country, that it's just a story that I think needs to be told, and it certainly has had a profound effect on me. I've learned to really value service and sacrifice. Go ahead, Dan. Well, my connection really is one uh, with the Historical Society because it's given me an opportunity to do several things. Number one is to meet nice people like Catherine and John who don't live in West Tennessee like I do. And the stories that we have here uh, are unique to us, uh, but they're also very important to us. Um, but beyond just the story of the Rona and how the connection is to the Dyersburg Army Air Base and Halls uh, is the fact that uh, this story does need to get out. People do need to know about it, but we've got a younger generation coming along. And as the uh, historical society here and those museums all across the country, and as Catherine said, telling a story will stay in your mind. If you tell it in the way of a story, it is a connection that happens. And then the fact that she's written that play, uh, our local arts council had sort of become dormant over the years until one of my board members here uh, heard the story of the Rona after us talking with Catherine and she sent us a copy of the uh, uh, apron strings play that she'd written. Well, that rejuvenates some interest in acting here. And so oh, that particular board member was a former director. And next thing you know, he calls uh, together people and we start putting together this play and these young people come out of the woodwork to audition. And then we start doing slideshows and pictures and we're all doing research and talking about it with young people. And we were fortunate that we were able to go to the uh, Rona Survivors Association in Memphis in 2018 and perform it for that group. But on top of that, we came back to Dyersburg and did it again here. So we've done it twice. Uh, we've got the whole connection there and you've got young people involved. And then this type of media today is gonna get out to others. So if people see it on Facebook, if we post things about the story from our point of view, because all of us have a different point of view here. Uh, the people who had survivors who were on the boat, those who lost their lives on the boat, and those people who weren't even born when this thing happened are realizing that if it wasn't for the Freedom of Information Act that brought this information out, it would still be squelched. And I just think that what John said earlier, he said one word that sticks in my mind today, and that is connections. It's all these connections help us put these pieces together and know these stories and be able to re recall them for future generations. That's where I come from. Absolutely. And uh, what this meant to me, it was the best history lesson, most powerful history lesson I ever had. I should have paid attention if I like to do a do over for my history classes, but this was uh, just a real personal, it became personal, but I was driven by the driving force behind this for me was Joe Weber. He's the historian. He's the, he was the passion. I was just a bit of a conduit. To, it was interesting Googling around and finding things. My wife was assisting me with much of that. But, um, but just to get into a project like this, I had never been part of anything like this before. And I see where, like Mark Consorti at West Haven High School, he pledged that they would keep this in their um, program for US history. And, uh, and if that can happen, I think there's, I think the survivors group, maybe Janice, she might be uh, running some kind of a program that they're gonna get out to schools. And I think that's a big part. And I think the, uh, the crew from the documentary too, I think that's an element of theirs is to get it out to the schools. And uh, then it'll become more personal for some, especially if they find family members somehow connected. I know it's 75 years later, but you still may be able to. So. Well, I want to thank all three of you for being with us today. It's been a great program, and I feel like I've personally learned a lot. I hope our viewers have too. I'm, um, I would invite um, folks to join us online for our next program, which is going to be on 
July the 16th at 7 p.m. It's an evening conversation. My colleague, Ali Kaif, is going to be speaking with uh, Stephen Thornton, who is uh, a well-known uh, local historian. He's going to be talking about the, uh, the history of Hartford protests, so I definitely would encourage you to tune in. And if you are local, please come down to the Old State House in Hartford because we do have the farmer's market running all summer. It's on Tuesdays um, and Fridays, and it's from 10 to 2 p.m. We, of course, are uh, following all um, recommendations to make sure that you and the vendors stay safe. And um, on Fridays, we will be having concerts at noon on the other side of the building. And again, wearing our masks, being socially distanced, but you can come out and enjoy some live music. So I want to thank all of our speakers for being here with us today. I want to thank all of you at home for viewing this. And um, we will be putting this eventually up on the Connecticut Network website and also on our YouTube channel for Connecticut's Old State House. Thank you all. Enjoy the afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.